Well, good morning. You know, what a good day it is to be together and to be focused upon our Lord Jesus Christ. To not get caught up in the cares and pleasures of this world, the concerns and worries, but to be renewed in our thinking, to gather together uh, that the truth of God's word would be a refreshing, uh, cleansing reality for us uh, in the midst of so many things vying for our attention, for our affections, for our focus in this life. I would say this, especially I think more so than ever before with some of the absences and, and things that we've experienced and the incompleteness of not being together. Uh, I would say this, to be together is sweeter than to be anywhere else. Anywhere else that I can imagine. As I sat in Sunday school this morning with a group of men and women with God's word open between us. And I thought, you know, for two weeks, this didn't happen. For two weeks, there was an absence of the ability to do that. And this morning, we got to sit and, and discuss the word of God to consider and extol his goodness and to consider his plans for each of us. To be together in the house of the Lord is sweeter than to be anywhere else. And to be with you all is certainly worth the cost, much less the risk. And so it is good to be here. I am thankful uh, for each of you and for this time this morning. Uh, to recognize together this morning what, what we should be doing every time we gather is to recognize in, in a unified togetherness what many of us have already realized. That he and he alone is worthy of our worship and he and he alone is worthy of our lives. Uh, that we have a momentary reality in the midst of eternity. It is this brief vapor which is called life. That we have a clear uh, will of the Lord for how we ought to use this life, live this life uh, day by day, moment by moment, in all that that encompasses, that he and he alone uh, is worthy of our worship and of our lives. And the second thing that should be happening is that there is an opportunity this morning to offer one more time, possibly the first time for some, and possibly the last time for some. That we get to offer the opportunity to come to know this truth of the good news of Jesus Christ and all of the peace and grace and hope that this and this alone brings to our lives. That's why we gather. That's why we're here for the unified ability as the body of Christ to do and accomplish these things. And I will say to you this beforehand, and I've never said this before, it is not every day that a preacher gets to stand and call the people to a choice in this way. Like Joshua and Elijah who stood before the people and declared to them, a choice must be made. Elijah said with all clarity that how long will you linger between two opinions? If Baal is God, then, then serve him. But if he's not, if Yahweh is God, then serve him. Joshua called the people together and said in very similar terms, Who choose you this day? Whom will you serve? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is a continual recognition before us. And I think that it's exposed most fully through this year. I'm, I'm thankful for 2020. Just like I'm thankful for 2019. Did my mic quit? No? Yeah? Yeah? Let me... <laughs> All right, 2020 continues. <laughs> but I am thankful because it is exposing so much about who we are. It's peeling back the complacency and the comfortability and bringing more to the forefront the realities of the temporariness of this life, of the uncertainty of circumstances, and that we are never to be those who put our hope in horses and chariots, but our hope is always in a single source that is unchanging and unaffected, by anything else and that that is the Lord. Joshua and Elijah recognized that and called the people to recognize that, to, to trust in the Lord in all things. And brothers and sisters, if you have read the accounts as these declarations in, of a choice were being made, they were not easy times. 
It was not easy circumstances for the people of God in the midst of these seasons. It never has been. Because to walk by faith in a contradiction to circumstances oftentimes will never be that which comes naturally. It is always a supernatural reality of who we are as believers. That because we have been born again, because we have been made a new creation, because there is a supernatural work of God in our salvation by which we are recreated in our redemption, we now have victory over that which is natural. And so the people of God have always been called to a reminder, to a recognition of these things. And our text this morning is one which demands just that. It does not leave you a comfortable spot on the sidelines. It does not leave you comfortable in justification of that which is wrong. It, it, it clearly shines light into all arenas of our life and then says, you must choose. It, it does not leave us even with a pondering. It brings us clearly to this point. This morning, we're going to be back in Matthew 25. We're in our Lord's next parable where he's exhorting his disciples to live lives which are ready in light of the unexpectedness of his return. In light of the unexpectedness of his return. We've been learning a lot, I pray, through our study of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, about what is the difference between our focus and our Lord's focus. What is the difference between our concerns and his concerns? We see it clearly in the text the disciples, they were worried about his return. Lord, when are you going to come back? How are we going to know? What are you going to do? What's this going to look like? They were just worried about his return. And our Lord has made clear that he was worried about what their condition will be when he returns. Right? That's, that's so clear in the text. Our Lord's focus is about the condition of his people when he returns. His people's focus is often about when is he going to return. And we need to realign ourselves to recognize what our Lord is teaching so that we ourselves might be those whom he doesn't need be concerned about when we see him next. We are too easily caught up in wanting to know the end of the story. It's our nature for sure. We want to know how it's all going to turn out. We want to know what tomorrow holds. But our Lord's will for us is all about how we live on all the pages that we have been given in his story. It's his story. He's been writing it since before you and I were ever even created. He has written it before the foundation of the world. It's his story according to his plan. And we have a role to play for sure. Praise God that he's given us purpose in this life. But it's his story. And we need to be those who are faithful to live every page according to his will for us. This parable is perhaps the most detailed in its illustration and point towards that. I would add that personally, this parable has done as much work in shaping my views of the Christian life as any other passage in all of Scripture. This parable is a constant reminder to my heart and soul, a constant guardrail for every aspect of my life. This parable is that which accomplishes so much work and the sanctification and conformity to Christ that I am desirous of and striving for daily. Read it together with me, and we're going to get right to the breakdown. We've got a lot to cover. This parable is more detailed, uh, and we're just going to walk through it together as we've done with many of the other parables. But we're beginning in verse 14 of Matthew 25. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Now the one who had received the five talents immediately went and did business with them and earned five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents earned two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have earned five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, 
good and faithful slave, for you are faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave, for you are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Now the one who had received the one talent came also and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed, and I was afraid. So I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have that which is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You worthless or wicked and lazy slave. Did you know that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would received, have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, our Lord has given us a lot to digest this morning. There is a lot that is confronting. There is a lot that is convicting. There is a lot that should cause us to consider well what is before us. So we're just going to walk through this parable. I don't have an outline of, of points Uh, The parable doesn't lend itself to that. There's too many details for me to try and break that down into very distinguishable points. We want to walk through this parable explaining it, noting and contrasting what is being said and not being said as we do. We begin right away in verse 14 where we have the, the beginning word that is a conjunction, the word for. And what that tells us is that this parable is a continuation of what the previous parable was teaching. It's the same theme. When we looked at those who were wise and foolish amongst the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids, we are called to be those who are wise and who are sensible as we await the master. Again, this parable goes into the greatest detail thus far as to what does the master expect from his people while he is away. For we who are in between the advents, we have the first coming of Christ established. We celebrate that. We recognize that. We all are aware of that. But there is another one coming. And we live in the midst or in between these two advents of our Lord. What we want to be careful, as we said two weeks ago, is that in the same way, although Scripture and signs and many, many, many other things from our Lord prepared the people that His first coming was upon them, the majority of them missed it. The majority of them were unprepared, ill-prepared. The majority of them were unbelieving. The majority of them rejected. We want to be careful in all ways that we, with the plethora of preparation that our Lord has made for us, that we also do not get caught up in the cares and pleasures of this life to the neglect and the missing of what is being taught in preparation for our time to see Him. We must be those who are wise and sensible as we await him. Now the storyline is is, it's very simple and straightforward. It doesn't have a a very detailed plot. We have a wealthy man who's departing for an extended absence on a journey. And in this absence, he entrusts his valuables, his possessions to his slaves, that they might care for them and labor for and with them. That's pretty much it. We recognize two do well and one does not, and the master, upon his return, responds accordingly. He settles accounts. But the details, the details are fascinating. We see that the point is made in verse 14, first and foremost, these are his own slaves. Making clear that they are all part of his household. This is not him hiring this out in his absence to the slaves of another household. These are those who are his slaves. Now, if you've already figured out that the master is representative of Jesus, then this makes clear that all three slaves are representative of those who are his disciples. Or to jump right to it, all three are professing Christians. 
Right? That would be our understanding going forward. And we saw that as two weeks ago we looked at the, the ten virgins. As they were awaiting, they were waiting on the right bridegroom. Right? They were waiting at the right residence. They were looking forward to his coming. They had their lamps. But some had prepared and lived in his absence according to their expectation and others had not. And they were locked out and not allowed in. The same thing here. What we have is three who are all on the outside looking very similar. They're professing Christians. And the master has entrusted his possessions to them in his absence. Now, there's a lot of speculation in what are his possessions. And we are going to look in further detail at how it breaks down. But let's just begin with this. Our Lord upon his ascension. When he, with this group of men that he's teaching in their presence here, when he in fact did depart, he does leave them with something. We know it is the Great Commission. He leaves them with a mission to be his salt and his light in his absence. To make disciples, teaching them, right, to gather them in unity through baptism and to teach them to obey all that he's commanded. He's left with them the body of truth that he taught them. He's left with them all of these things. He's also given them this mission and he leaves them with his authority as he himself will be with them always, even unto the end of the age. So I would say just in a sense of getting a, a glimpse of what's on display here, when the Lord says that there's a man who left on a long journey and he left to his slaves, his possessions, that they would do well. One of the things we can immediately look to is the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, upon our Lord's ascension, his departure, he very clearly says to his disciples, here is my mission for you. Here is what I am entrusting you with. Here is the authority by which you will carry that out. Here is the means by which you will do it. Here is the will that I have that you would not only make disciples, but in the making of disciples, you would teach them obedience to all of my commands. It's very clear in this. But in verse 15, we start seeing of chapter 25, some of the more interesting elements of the details of this parable. The one is simple and straightforward, but, but then it goes into this, this description that says each disciple receives a different measure. Each one will receive a different measure, and that's a little bit confusing to us. He says they were each given talents. One received five, one received two talents, and one received one talent. Now to be clear, a talent in Palestine, it was not, a, it was not simply that which denoted wealth. It was a unit of measurement according to weight. Likely, it was about 75 pounds in our modern understanding. So, so basically, he's saying, I've given you about 75 pounds of my possessions of that which is valuable. Now, the easy recognition is that this is financially valuable. We don't know if it was gold. We don't know if it was silver or if it was copper or something else. We don't know exactly what is on display, and that's not the point of the parable. The point is that the master went away. And he entrusted a very specific task with provision to accomplish that task to those who are awaiting his return. It, seeing this, some have gotten bogged down in trying to figure out value. I've seen estimates where it's things like, well, if that was gold, 75 pounds of gold would equal this much in our time. And my goodness, that's, that's a huge of great value. I think that's a mistake. I don't think the point of this is recognizing how valuable the talent was. I think the outcome and the settling of accounts makes clear just how valuable it was, whether it's worldly value or financially attributed or whether it's just the recognition of the master's expectation. The focus of the master, of the, as the parable makes clear, was care for him, care for him translated into the faithful labor in his absence, not value or worth. In other words, it's not as though the one who is entrusted with one was held less accountable than the one who was entrusted with five. So to try and establish just how valuable were the talents, I think, is a, is a wrong focus of this. Each were given varying amounts, and each will be measured by what they received, not what the other had in any stretch of that. Each was given the possessions of the master in his absence. And they were giving varying degrees. This is amazing. We are told according to their ability. According to their ability. Now, this has such rich truth for our hearts this morning. Think about it in this term. What the Lord's saying is that he knows us individually. 
And he calls us according to our abilities to run our race for him. To the one who is capable in more, more was given. Think about the grace in this. In the giving of more to the one who is able to handle more, how much protection was there for that one to not be slothful and become complacent? Think about that. If he could handle five, but the Lord had only given him two, it would have been so easy for him to become worthless and lazy, complacent. I got this handled. But the Lord knows and gave exactly what they were capable of to them. How about the other one? He gave less, which guarded that person possibly from fearful overwhelmedness. Oh my goodness, I can't. Five? That's, I can do two. But not five. Our Lord knows. He gave exactly in accordance to the individual, the intimate knowledge of the individual. According to his ability, he gave. The second thing that should be so encouraging for us is that we are not in competition with one another for his affection. There's so much disunity at times in the body and it arises from a competitive wrong view of, well, this is what makes me the better Christian. This is what I'm doing to accomplish these things. That's never the picture. We're not in competition with one another for his affection. I am so thankful as we have studied church history Over the past several Sunday nights, I am not competing with Charles Haddon Spurgeon for the affection of our Lord. I'm not. I was never called to. I'm not competing with anyone. In any stretch of that, I am simply laboring to the faithfulness with what I, Philip Smith, have been entrusted with according to the ability that my Lord, who knows all things and does all things well, saw fit to place upon me. That's our measurement for each of us. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he was measured against the race that he was given to run. And so too will I be. There's no competition in this. Our Lord is building his church. And he is doing so piece by individual piece to the building up of the body. It's amazing. We don't don't have time to go into it. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it says that God composes the body. Just as he ordains. And in that, the Apostle Paul uses the easy to understand illustration of a physical body. Where he says not everyone in the body is an eyeball. How crazy would that be? Not everyone is an ear. And he goes into this description that's so physically easy for us to grasp. And in the same way, how does God compose the body? Well, he saves men and he saves women. And in Romans 12, it says he gives them giftedness at their grace. He entrusts them with things. And in that... They then, in obedience, by faith in him, use their gifts to his service. And guess what happens? The body is built. Ephesians 4, it is built up upon those who, in obedient service to the Lord, to the use of what he has entrusted to them, build the body. And we're not all eyeballs. Not everybody has five talents. Not everybody has two talents. Some have one. And they are essential. And they are integral to the Lord's plans, to the accomplishment of his purposes. We are not in competition to see who can be the best eyeball and nobody wants to really be the nose or the tongue or the ear. Listen, you try functioning for a week without your thumbs. I said it today in Sunday school. I don't know what my pancreas does and I don't think about it every day, but if it stops doing what it's doing, I'll start thinking about it that day. Right? And scripture speaks to these things and giving us this understanding. This, this is what we need to understand. God is building his body And this is how he's accomplishing it, individual by individual. We're told with clarity that there is the apostles are the foundation, Ephesians 2, Christ himself being the cornerstone. And guess what every other individual brick is? Us. According to his purpose and his will, he has a plan for us. And you need to stop or or not worry about anyone else's brick. And you need to focus on how you're handling the gap you're supposed to fill. So let's talk about what are some of the talents. What are, what are talents that we're given for which we're accountable? What are, what are the things the Lord's given? We talked already about the big picture. It is ascension. He gave us a mission. He gave us a mission with everything that was necessary to the accomplishment of it. I think that's an amazing recognition that it should be so encouraging. It, we can't speak to the exact amount. But what we do know is that a talent was probably likely paramount to about 20 years labor for the average servant or slave. 
it was that of great value. And so the master said, hey, I am leaving. And I expect you to do well in my absence, but don't worry, I'm going to lavishly give you all that you need to accomplish anything I would ask of you. So encouraging for my heart that the Lord knowing me gives me exactly what I'm able to do, asks of me in the race he's called me to exactly what he knows and is intimately provided for me to accomplish. More than that, he's lavished those things upon us to the accomplishment. So what are some of the talents that we have as a responsibility into which we will give an account or we are held accountable for. Well, obviously we have spiritual gifts. We've addressed that, but think of it in this terms. Turn with me to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, there's a clarity that one of the things that we're given by the Lord as His servants are spiritual gifts. Beginning in verse 3 of Romans chapter 12, this is what Paul says. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. Now our sermon this morning is not on spiritual gifts, but oftentimes people say, well, how do I know what my gift is? You jump in and serve until you recognize what it is that the Lord has given you an ability and a desire to do. That's it. It's not about taking some test and figuring out what someone else thinks your gift may be. It's about you looking around and saying, what are the needs that I can serve in? What are areas that I'm physically capable? Even it might be a sacrifice of my time. Those are things. But as I look at the church, what are areas that are an area of need? Whether it be an area of encouragement, whether it be through the the preparing of meals, whether it be through serving in conferences, whether it be serving in the nursery, whether it be being part of those who count the finances and oversee certain areas. There are multiple needs here from We've had men and women who have made it their, their burden to pull weeds here on the campus and to help keep it beautiful. There are opportunities for service and in those things. And so people say, well, how do I know where I'm gifted? Jump in. Jump in and let's see what you're capable of. Let's see where the Lord has burdened you. Let's see where your abilities lie. Let's see where your desires lie. Get involved. Number two, this is one that's often overlooked. What's the talent that we've been given? Maturity. Maturity. God is maturing his people. We can be confident, Philippians 1, 6, that he who begun this work will complete it. There is an element where within the body of Christ, within us as individuals, we are growing in maturity according to God's work. Now, these are hard-won gifts from our Lord, and they happen through gray hairs and trials. Right? That's why we have passages like Titus 2 that says, let those who are mature teach these things. We have passages like Galatians 6 that says, you who are mature, come alongside those who are struggling, that you might serve them in this way. These are hard-won gifts from our Lord, and they don't just happen. They happen over time and trials and discipline and growth. And we are certainly to use them, and we are not to hold the wisdom of maturity close. We're to use it to the service of others. We're to entrust to other faithful men the truths that we have been given so that for the generations that will come, they will be protected for all. We're not to yield even for a moment in submission to those who would contradict. We're to call out falsehood. We're to proclaim truth. We're to stand on that bedrock, bedrock no matter the cost so that for the generation that's coming, it will be available to them as well. For them to know. Maturity is a gift to the body that every individual should be experiencing. And as you grow in maturity, you then take that maturity and you use it to serve the less mature. And any healthy church will have across the spectrum from an unbeliever to a saint on the verge of standing before the Lord. All things covered in the body. The next one. Knowledge. Goodness. It's amazing to me sometimes how neglectful we can be of such an amazing gift. We have the mind of God. We can know the will of the... So many people say to me, if I just knew what God's will was for me, 
Oh, you can know. We can know what is God's will for us. Knowledge. We, we are told in Scripture that we are to be those who share our faith. Again, to entrust it to, to others, to teach the younger in faith how to live properly. We're to share this knowledge. We're, we're to proclaim with boldness from the rooftops the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation and obedience to him. The peace and grace that passes all understanding that comes through knowing in whom we have trusted and believing that he is able to keep that which he has given. Opportunities. Opportunities. This one is possibly the hardest to quantify because it's so individual. Yes, we all together have a great commission. Yes, we all together as individuals are called to the building up of the body of Christ into one body. These are clear for all of us. But what I'm talking about here are the unique opportunities due to your job, your social circles and the Lord's providence and who he created you to be and where he placed you. That you have unique opportunities that are very specific to you. You have people in your life with whom you can share the gospel that I will never meet. That I will never meet. That you can be that salt and be that light to them. Common opportunities show goodness and kindness within the church and to others. But broad spectrum. Here's one that's going to terrify you. Pandemics are opportunities. <laughs> you know, I, I think sometimes that we spend so much time focusing on it as this horrible thing and yet we don't recognize do we really believe what we say we believe is our God sovereign or is he not is he sovereign except for viruses can slip through his fingers is he sovereign or is he not he has given this and my question is everyone's ready for it to be over and I, I get that listen we're not those who rejoice in trials in some morbid weird way but at the same time let me ask you what are you so ready for it to be over? To get back to what? To the normalcy that probably wasn't honoring to the Lord or possibly wasn't? What are you in such a rush to get back to? Dads, are you in a rush to get back to where you can check out from your family and just plug in at work? What are we in a rush to get back to? Maybe it's a wonderful thing. Certainly there are wonderful things that we have been limited in through this. But are we rightly assessing them? <laughs> Have you used this unique and yet universal time that we are in to glorify our Father who is in heaven? Or have you grumbled? Have you complained? Have you tested the Lord in these areas? Certainly we are all sinners. And certainly this is going to land on each of us in some form or fashion. But the reminder this morning is to take a step back and say, wait a second, my God is sovereign. And my God has chosen to give this unique season in every component. This day, I will serve the Lord. This day, I will honor him. And tomorrow, when it comes, that will be my desire as well. With whatever it holds or doesn't. Have we used this time, this wonderful election cycle that we're in, have we used it to foster humility and love, to cultivate patience and kindness, to exercise our faith that we might be those who walk in faith? Amen. Or have we used it as an excuse to sin? Because heaven knows God couldn't have seen this coming. Heaven knows that, that this cannot be his plan as though somehow Election officials can thwart God's plan. Stop and think for a minute sometimes before we speak. We need to be reminded, do we believe what we say we believe? And I believe the answer is yes. I believe the majority of us sitting here can say, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. And my prayers that we're being reminded this morning from God's word as we ought to, to believe what we believe, to help our unbelief. This is God's provision for it. Another talent that we're given, another thing is material blessings. Are you using them to the glory of God? I'm, I'm glad your business is thriving. But what will Jesus say when he sees you? We're going to talk more about that. Physical giftedness and ability. This one's interesting. I, I called it the horse. 
The reason for that is Andrew Murray McShane made the statement as he died at a very young age. He was a believer for about five years, and that guy rocked the world in that five years. And he died at a, at a young age. And he said this at the end. He says, I've been given the gospel and a horse, and I've killed the horse, meaning his physical body. And so I, I called this the horse but here's what I recognize. So many are laboring to protect their horses so they can accomplish their purposes. And the question that we're given in this parable is, what have you done with, your, with this body and with your health to the glory of Jesus Christ this week? How have you used what you've been given to glorify him? Or have you so protected your horse because you don't want anything to interfere with your plans that you in fact have locked yourself away from having opportunity to glorify God. From any of the things that we've been called to. We need to ask these hard questions because Jesus Christ is going to ask these hard questions. He has entrusted you with the body he's given you. He's entrusted you with the days he has allotted to you and you cannot exceed them. Job 14 is abundantly clear. And he's not going to say, well, what did you do with the time I didn't give you? No, he knows. He gave it. He's going to say, what did you do with what I did give you? For Andrew Murray McShane, he, he was basically the guy given one talent. Five years. Five years. And that guy, if we were to measure it according to this, that guy produced 25 talents in his five years out of the one that he was given. Who, who are we? Are we running our race? Are we, are we throwing off that which hinders us and avoiding the sin which doth so easily entangle us? Are we like good soldiers seeking to please the one who has enlisted us? Or have we forgotten who we are and instead gotten caught up? And what do we want? What do we want to accomplish? What are our plans? What are our desires? To the absolute neglect of being reminded that we have been given this, allotted this by our master, and he will call us to an account. Everyone who names the name of Christ has both abilities and responsibilities from him and to him. If you were to measure the last three months of your life as though he was returning today, would you see more service to self or service to him in all areas of your life? thought, word, and deed. And can I just caution you, you should be honest because as we're going to see in the parable, he will be. There's nothing hidden from him. The psalmist says it so clearly. Where, where can I go? You know the recesses of my heart. There's nothing hidden from him and he will call for an account. You will be honest. You should start today. I should start today. Because me thinking that I'm going to slide it past him? No. I'm not. And you're not. Be honest. Because he will be. Now, in the next several verses, what we're going to see are, what are the three servants' responses to this gift and responsibility that was given to them? Two of them immediately went to work with what they had been given, but one of them went and dug a hole and buried it. So two things stand out in the good responses. The first one to me is the word immediately. Immediately. There, there, was no, there was no, well, let me just sleep on it. Let me, let, me, let me take a year off. I mean, I don't need to work right now. I got this. Let me just take some time off and I'll get back to this. No, immediately. And the second thing is, is work. The word which is used here. Uh, that describes us doing business. It's used over 40 times in the New Testament. And it denotes labor or work in measurable, visible action. <laughs> the idea of actually being visibly different and committed to the Lord is nothing new in Scripture. This is not a new premise that our Lord just presented. He already addressed it multiple times. Think of Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says... Not everyone who gives lip service to me saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who will enter is the one who does the will of my father. The one who has actionable evidences 
that they in fact have trusted me as Lord, Lord. We, we hear passages where Jesus says, why, why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I say? You can't have both. He's either Lord and in being Lord, you in faith do as he says because he's Lord. Or he's not Lord and you don't have faith. That's the only thing that's governed by that. And we see this. These are the evidences that we can, that we can examine. And this is such a gift. Because if we wait for him to return or for us to go to him, he's going to examine with piercing perfect clarity the intentions of the heart and the recesses of all areas. And nothing will be hidden from him. Amen. Or you can examine now. In humility and faith, step back from that which is contrary to him and step forward in that which he has commanded us to be and do. For his commands are not burdensome. And by this, we know that we have come to love him, that we keep his commands. In James chapter 2, uh, we won't read the whole thing, but in verses 14, 18, 19, 20, and 26, they'll be up here. Just a quick summary of what the half-brother of our Lord is saying here. He says this in verse 14, What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? That's a wonderful question. That's the question we're faced with. Can trust or proclamation that Jesus is Lord be sufficient to salvation if there's not only not evidence, but evidence to the contrary? Certainly not evidence is sufficient. He goes on and says this in verse 18, but someone may well say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you or visibly display to you my faith by my works. He then says in verse 8, 19, you believe that God is one? You do well. <laughs> so many people lean on this. I believe in God. Well, he says that the demons also believe. They believe with such clear knowledge that it brings them to fear. They shudder. Look at verse 20. But are you willing to acknowledge? And this is strong language. You foolish person that faith without works is useless. We see that same connotation, this worthless slave, this useless faith. Verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. This is nothing new. This parable of the talents is not a new understanding of God and his plan, God and his will, God and his word. And what I would say to you is here's grace that it's being presented to you who are hearing this morning. It's just common. More worthy endeavors have been derailed by a lack of getting started than anything else. We have heard it said continually that the hardest step is always the first one. It's true. It's true. And so, so many people get derailed in the faith that they've professed because they never take that first step into action. Listen, these men were given their resources. They were given the responsibility of those resources. And immediately, these first two, man, they went into action. They went into action. I've heard so many so many when they are confronted with a lack of any visible, discernible service. And guys, this is, we talked about this on Wednesday night, that there is a difference between being kind and being nice. That the kindest thing that we oftentimes are called to do is expose falsehood. If someone has a wrong view that is dangerous to them, we want to expose that, shine light into that so that they can see it before it destroys them. We need to recognize this. And yet, so many times when, when saying to someone, just in an evangelistic setting, hey, do you know where you would go when you would die? Or do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Or however you're able to open that door. And they respond with an immediate, oh, yes. And my next question is, usually it might be someone that I know. Well, what do you do about this? What do you do about the lack of this? I'm concerned. I'm concerned that it is not well with your soul because these areas are a contradiction to God's word. I'm concerned and man, hang on, hang on, because it's not generally seen as very nice to actually say to someone, I'm talking about you. I'm concerned about your soul. I understand what you're saying with your mouth, but, but these choices are speaking louder 
what's going on? And my desire in that is not embarrassment. My desire in that is repentance. Because sin destroys. Sin is death. Sin is a cruel slave master. And the Lord has given us freedom. And so when someone's submitting themselves to sin as their master, they're missing all the goodness and freedom and joy and peace that Christ has provided. It is the most loving and kind thing you can do, but it's not seen as nice. And when confronted with it, almost immediately there's this justification. Huh, well, I do more than so-and-so. I mean, did you just hear about this other pastor that, that fell? I mean, you know, I, I do more than so-and-so. I don't think that's the measurement that we see in this parable. Or, you know, Jesus never wanted us to think about him all the time. I mean, I have a business to run. I can't, I can't just think about Jesus all the time. Or maybe I'm just not built that way. Look, pastor, that's good for you, but I'm just not built that way. God didn't make me that way. It's his fault. This one comes up a lot. I love Jesus, but that church just won't do it my way. So I have no place to serve my talents. It's, it's his fault. He did not build his church according to my plans. He did not provide for me to the greatest degree. I just, I'm just paralyzed. Or possibly they realize it. You're right. But they make excuses instead of getting started. I know. I know. But you just don't understand how hard it is to follow Christ in my field. I know. But I just feel like it's too late to start. It's not. It's not. They went immediately. Immediately. You can begin today. You can start today. I don't care what you've done for the last 73 years, 73 days, 73 months. I don't care. You can begin today to serve and honor the Lord. And it is sufficient. It's all he asks of us. They who don't start and continue are like this third servant. They've buried the responsibilities under a mountain of justification and excuses. Let, let me ask you this morning, will the master be okay with any justifications and excuses? It's a simple question. It's amazing how many men are ready to offer excuses to Jesus that they would never accept from their own employees. It's just a fact. Many people will take massive parts of this and completely reject it and expect Jesus to accept them when they would never expect such Behavior from those whom were serving them. <laughs> but he's worse. But, but it's their fault. But what? When you stand before the Lord on that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, are you ready? Are you ready today for that day? Do you think you have an excuse good enough for him? The one who died for you? The holy and perfect one who condescended to take on flesh and to suffer at the hands of his own creation? I love when we sing that song about the crucifixion of Christ and it says the earth quakes as its maker bows his head. Goodness, do we see him as he is? Are we viewing life through the lens of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came and gave himself for you and I? Are we seeing it through some other lens? Do you have an excuse good enough for him who died for you? The next verse, the Lord slips in a little preparation in verse 19. He says, after a long time... After a long time, the master returns. Let's just be clear. He's been preparing us. We have recognition now in our own experience. Imagine how amazing it is that we're a generation 2,000 plus years removed that we can look and say, oh, it's going to be a while. It's been a while. Right? We, we can look back. We have church history, the study that we've been in on Sunday nights. We have the ability to look back and see this. It ain't going to be quick. Oh, but it is coming. Second Peter chapter 3 says, don't 
worry when men mock, saying, where is he? Oh, he's coming. He is coming. And when he does, he will settle his accounts. Now back for just a quick moment to the slaves who went to work immediately. To be clear, I'm sure in the master's absence, in the daily grind of life, they had their ups and downs. I don't think that everything they touched just turned to gold. There's no promise of that. There's no recognition of that. I'm sure that every day was a difficulty in its own way in their endeavors. But these two men consistently labored for the master who had given according to ability. And when he returned, their fruits were evident and readily available to be presented. But consider the one who buried it. Basically, what he's saying here, just so we can be clear, is I don't want the responsibilities of laboring for my master. That's all he said. That's what he did. I want to go and do my own thing, and I don't want to have to deal with the master's possessions, but rather, I want to be focused on myself. I want today to be about me. And if I take this and start messing with it, I got to worry about that. I got to have responsibility of that, and I don't want to deal with all that. Listen. And the labor for the master, we will have difficult days. There will be those who reject. There will be those who defect. It will not all be days of great gain and success, but over time, you are given, you will see gains made, and you will see fruit from your labor. Faint not in well-doing. Why? Because he doesn't want us to faint? No, because if we don't faint, we will see a harvest. If we will continue forward, for we have need of perseverance, as we learned last week, it is a difficult thing. But remember this in your race. You are not measured against others. Stop looking around. You are measured against yourself in the race in which the master has called you to run. He has specifically and will reveal and has revealed to you what is his will for you. And the only thing you need to know is run. Throw off anything that entangles you. Avoid that which hinders you and run. The third servant just checked out and said, nope, ain't going to do it. I don't have time to deal with my master's stuff. I want to focus on me. Now consider the master's response to these men. To the two who had labored for the master and produced fruit from his possessions, they were given accolades and affirmation. Now don't underestimate this. This is a big deal. This will be a very big deal. We recognize it limitedly here. We do all like to be recognized for our work, right? If you do a good job, you want there to be recognition, whether it come in the form of a raise, whether it come in the form of a, hey, well done. It, do not underestimate this. We like to be recognized for doing well. We all like to hear kind and affirming things, especially from someone who matters to us. Now, the point is there is none who matters more than Jesus, and let me be most specifically clear, especially on the day of settling accounts. His voice will matter, y'all. What he says to you will matter. Do not negate that they were given affirmation and accolades. That's a big deal. To come from Jesus? Listen, it will be a huge deal to hear from him, well done. Well done. For those who take the responsibility of grace seriously and labor well for the Lord, the second thing we see, they get more responsibility. <laughs> We're told that. It's not a secret. Jesus said in John 15, his father is the vine dresser. When a vine produces fruit, when a branch produces fruit, it gets trimmed, pruned, so that it will produce more fruit. We get greater responsibility. And what's most interesting in the context here makes clear that this is the end of their earthly time when the accounts are settled. Right? This is the return of Christ. That's what the theme of these two chapters have been. At, at the time of recompense. Earthly, at least as we know it, this is addressing either millennial saints at the return of Christ, those who are left in the judgment rapture we looked at, that set up and rule here on earth with Christ, or this is eternal saints at the time of their recompense, which is described for us in 2 Corinthians 5. Both categories fit, and to be clear, both will be absorbed. Those saints that enter into the millennial kingdom not facing death will still face the marriage supper of the Lamb and the, the white throne judgment. And some in that time will reject the Lord as we know when Satan's released at the conclusion of it. Both categories fit and both will in fact be absorbed into the other. In other words, this is a description of what's going to happen when Christ returns or when we see him in death. In other words, heaven is a place that is not 
there's, there's no picture in scripture of heaven being a place where we sit on clouds singing. And just so you're clear, you're not going to be lounging in your mansion on holier than thou lane. That's not at all a picture that's given anywhere in scripture. We will continue in joyful service with and to our Lord. But we will do so apart from the yoke of slavery to the sin and the destruction and futility that it brings round about us continually. Now this principle is also taught for this temporary life. That we who have been given and do well with it will be given more. That's the pruning of the, of the branch for the production of fruit. The more we serve, the more we are blessed. Brother John read this in Jesus' opening message, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. As you do, you shall receive. That's the simple understanding that's continually in here. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Not because you're being a jerk. Not because you've been dishonest or unfaithful, but because of Christ. Blessed are you when they insult you for that. Not because of your political views or other things, but because of your faithfulness to Christ. Blessed are you then. Rejoice and be glad. So, the point is, blessed are you who labor visibly and produce for me, for you will receive. You will receive. The picture that's given, for example, in 2 Corinthians 9 is this understanding of like a funnel. That when God finds a vessel that is in fact using what he has given to the accomplishment of his purposes, he pours into it until it overflows. Why? Because as he pours into it, what's it doing? It's being used to the accomplishment of his purposes so that what you receive, you might continue to use for greater service to him. This is a very common reality taught all over scripture. And then we have the one who buried his responsibility and just refused to deal with it. Because that's what he did. He just took it and buried it in the dirt. The first thing we see is what we mentioned earlier. Immediate excuse making and justification. Look at verse 24. Now the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid. So I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what is yours. Now this is not the truth about our Lord. That's not the point of this. What the point is, is that this man had a wrong view of the Lord that showed itself in his actions. He did not love Jesus. He did not love the master. He did not trust the master. He saw the master wrongly and it showed itself. He buried what he'd been given. Man, what's amazing to me is his arrogance. He's actually trying to blame the master for his failure. This is your fault. You... I, I'm smarter than these two. I know you. I know you. And uh, uh And then he points to what he deems sufficient. And he says to the master, accept it. Accept it. I buried it. Here's what's yours. I didn't spend any of it. I kept all of it for you. Accept this. <laughs> what's terrifying is how common this is today within the church. There are folks who are listening to this who know that if Jesus returned today, he would not be pleased with them. Because they have been wholly focused upon themselves. And yet, justification and excuses abound. Which, by the way, when we do things our way in ministry, it's no different. We can't point to our, our deeds and say, but God, I did these amazing, wonderful things if they weren't his will for us. <laughs> in other words, there will be those who point to the way in which they did ministry. Well, Jesus... I didn't make any disciples, but I passed out 17,000 tracts. And it's not wrong to pass out tracts. This is not an indictment against that. But the question becomes, are you doing what the Lord said? Or are you doing what you want and throwing his name in the mix a little bit? Well, Jesus, I did not grow your church through the service and obedience of the gift you've given me. But I did go on 23 and a half mission trips. It would have been 24, but you know, that was your thing. You kept me off that one. Well, Jesus, I never grew in maturity, but I did show up every week. Guys, you will be called to settle accounts. Remember this guy, he didn't spend the master's talent on wild living. This is not the prodigal son. 
This is not someone who went out and hired prostitutes and lived it up. He just simply said, I have better things to do with my life than worry about you and your responsibilities. Huh. This is no different than Jesus. I did not do what you called me to, but I did do some other really great things, which I think you're going to love. It's not going to fly. And you need to hear that today. Before that day, you need to ask yourself, am I doing what the master has said and trusted and called me to? Or am I doing what I want and going to ask him to accept it on that day? Obviously, the servant was surviving. He wasn't with the pigs like the prodigal son. He wasn't eating the husks that were thrown to them. He might have even been thriving. But what the master wanted was an accounting with how his investment was faring, not how well the servant was doing. This is so important. When we give our accounts to the Lord, we don't get to hold up our accomplishments. Jesus, look at the size of my business. <laughs> Jesus, Look at the size of my house. Look at all that I did with this years you've given me. Jesus, I finished law school. Think about this. You, what can you offer? How about this one, guys? Let's, be, let's get real. Jesus, I spent my entire life laboring and, and, and totally lived a Spartan existence, and I came up with a cure for cancer. Aren't you proud of me, Jesus? You think he's going to say yes? Do you think that's his concern on that day that we cure cancer that we come up with a vaccine these aren't wrong to labor and these aren't wrong to pursue but if they are to the neglect of what he has entrusted we are not going to be well received on that day he will say to you but what about my kingdom I'm glad you're thriving that's great I'm glad things are going well for you. I'm glad your business is growing and your house is large and, and you're really serving humanity. That's wonderful. But you know what? They're going to die. They're going to die. Cancer's cure is not going to end death. A vaccine is not going to end death. Death is upon us. Death is a reality that we all face. Death is a short vapor of a life and then eternity. He's not interested in what you did with this life according to your plans. He's interested in what you did with what he has given, the grace that he has brought into the world. But Jesus, didn't you hear me? Jesus, maybe you didn't hear. I won the Nobel Prize. I didn't waste my life. I was so busy with my agenda, you couldn't possibly have expected me to worry about yours. What this reveals is the true condition of our hearts. That's why it's so important that we take note today. Because he's going to reveal it. On this day, you can't hide it. He will reveal it. The question becomes, what a grace that before he reveals it, we can examine it. Listen, it's the condition of the heart that's on display here. Two slaves, they loved and trusted the master. And it showed in their devotion to him and the embracing of the responsibility he gave them. This one, he never trusted the master and he wanted no part of any responsibility unto him. And what was the outcome? Verse 26, but the master answered and said to him, you worthless, lazy slave. Remember the accolades the first two got? This is the other side of it. This is the other reason why those are going to be so important on that day. Did you know that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? This slave was not considered good or even okay because they did no harm to what they had been given. It's not like I'm an atheist. It's not like I'm a Muslim who's opposing Christianity. Surely, God, you can see the difference. It doesn't matter. And he says it doesn't matter. Jesus says it doesn't matter. So the question becomes, are we going to believe him? He was not considered good, nor even, nor even passable, because he didn't do harm. He was called worthless or wicked and lazy. The master goes on to say in verse 27, you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. You, you should have cared enough to do something that showed you were concerned about me. This is where we clear, see clearly, it's not about value nor even volume. It's all about view. Two slaves viewed him as worthy. And in love, 
In obedience, they served him. One slave viewed him as not worthy. And in distrust and dislike, he buried what he'd been given. It's about view, not volume. Listen, the master gave some five, he gave some two, he gave others one. And all he expected was they would take it seriously because of him being the one who gave it. Two viewed him in his commands and expectations rightly, each laboring immediately over a long period of time and having something to show for what they had been given. The other one, he never trusted the master and he simply used this as an excuse to continually shirk the responsibility. 28 and 29, therefore take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Those who see this life rightly through the lens of grace, see it through the responsibility of grace. As they labor for the Lord, he pours out blessings and opportunities to labor all the more. And for those who never actually see their lives through the lens of grace, they suffer eternal loss. That's the distinction. That's, there's no middle road. There are those who do and those who don't. Verse 30 makes this clear. And throw, throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the reality that faces every single human being. Life or destruction. Life or destruction. It's not a mystery. It's not a guessing game. If you have some idea that you're going to stand before the Lord and give him an excuse that he hasn't thought of, you're thinking wrongly. Our Lord has told us what his will and what his standards are. The question we're asked today is how do you view him and how do you view his words? And just so you know, our actions, our choices reveal what is true about us. They reveal what is our view of him. I love that our Lord has a plan, a perfect plan wherein every person has a part to play according to his plan and to the accomplishment of his purposes. And in that he's given, he's lavishly given all that is needed to accomplish his purposes. And he causes people to take that which he has given them in an obedience out of love for him who has given it, act upon it. To say no to the desires of our flesh and to say yes to the call of the spirit as is clearly laid out in the word. So the only question today is, are you ready? Are you ready? That's the question. That's the point of everything he's laying out. He will come when you don't expect it. Like a thief in the night, and if the man of the house knew the thief was coming, he would make preparation. But that's not how Christ will return. He will return when you don't expect it. He will call you to settle the account when you don't expect it. So the question that we are given is, are you ready? And the wonderfully good news is that you can be. You can be. If you realize today that you are the wicked, lazy slave who have professed to trust Christ, but by your actions you have buried what he's given you in a hole and done everything you can to avoid any measure of responsibility before him, then start immediately to use what he has given you to serve him and run your race. Start today. It is sufficient. The thief upon the cross began that day and ended that day. His race was a short one, but he did it. Today is your wake-up call. Dig it up, dust it off, and get after it. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, you are kind beyond measure.